can take a seat. Thank you for being with us this morning. My name is Ryan G and I serve as the middle school pastor here at Three Crosses. And I hope for your guys' sake, since you made it to 11 a.m., that you got an extra hour of sleep. Hopefully you didn't pull a move like me and stay up an extra hour later, but we're glad you're here this morning. And as you know, we are adjusting to this new time change and getting ready for the holidays and making our schedules. I, I hope that we are not doing this alone. I hope that we as a church can partner with you and bring you into our community. There are so many things going on and as we're navigating this time, we're trying to do it safely, but there's so many different things that are happening, uh, not only on this hill, but also within this community. And so we just ask you guys to be a part of what's going on. You can do this by visiting threecrosses.org. And just there's so many different opportunities for children, adult, and students just to participate in what God's doing. And I know it's really easy, especially for the introverts out there like myself, to stay at home and watch Netflix all day. But this really is a time where we need to connect um, and we need each other as the church to be God's people. And so I would just encourage all of us to find ways that we can be God's people. And for students, uh, this has been quite the challenge this year. Um, as we've been meeting on Zoom with college students, high school students and middle school students, uh, it's been difficult. But uh, the amazing thing is to see uh, the creative ways and just the amazing opportunities there's been to see God work in our students' lives. This past week, we did a, a costume party here at the church, and even though it was weird handing individual bags of candy and kids were wearing face masks, wear their costumes, it was really awesome just to see students connect with God and each other and really make amazing memories together. And so our hope would be the same for you that are here and joining us online, that you would find ways to find community in a time where, you know, we can't do the things that we're normally used to. But if you've been with us for the past couple of weeks, you know we were going through this series called Centuries of Strife. And it's just basically this idea that, you know, we will all go through conflict, uh, especially here at church, as God is bringing different people of different ages and different backgrounds together. And as we spend time with one another um, and we have conversations, there's going to be times where we have understanding and connection and we get along great. And there's other times when we just are bickering, where we have disagreements and there's hurt and conflict. And this is not just a problem that we have today, right? It's something that's been happening throughout history and even with the early church. And so we've been discovering through scripture just what are we supposed to do to have healthy conflict? Because it's not something we can just avoid. It's not something that you try to just be right and win the argument. It's something that we have to work through together and through God's wisdom and through courage and compassion, we can work through all these disagreements we have as the body of Christ, as the church. And so I would just encourage all of us just to have this posture of humility and honesty as we talk about these very difficult things that are going in our church and in our community and in our world. And so another way you can participate with us as well is to give. And if you're able to, there's a couple of different ways you can do this. You can go to threecrosses.org slash give, or you can text three crosses to the number 77977. And this is an opportunity for us to give back to God what he's given us and to give to those in the community that are in need and to help different ministries that we partner with. And so that's a way you can get on board with what we are doing, not only in this hill, but also in the world as well. And so, like I said, I'm a middle school pastor, and so I like to bring a sense of energy into the room because usually I feel it with students. And so for the students that are watching on the stream and for any students that are in here, you'll know this routine and this tradition, but it's something called the prayer position. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's a simple uh, call and response. And so all I'll say is assume the prayer position and then in beautiful unison, together we'll clap our hands. And so the timing sometimes gets off. And so I know we're not a, normally a clapping church. So this is your chance to clap really loudly so the people online can hear it. So are you guys ready? All right, here we go. Would you please assume the prayer position? Let's try it one more time. First service was a little better. Okay, here we go. Would you please assume the prayer position? Excellent. 
God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the gift of today and for your presence, for life and breath. And God, we thank you that you are with us. God, thank you for this opportunity we have to worship you and to connect with those who believe in you. God, as we are a community that will face conflict, God, as we face it with our family, whether it's disagreements with our coworkers or our friendships or even in the world, we see so much disagreement, God. We see so much strife. And it's easy to give into fear. It's easy to give into anger and frustration. God, especially as this pandemic still goes on and the election is coming up. God, we need your perspective. We need your peace. God, we need your kingdom to come and your will to be done. God, as we are just looking for your peace, I just pray specifically for the Ledbetter family. God, as they've lost a son and a brother, God, they need your presence. And as a community, we mourn with them because we know we've lost a special member that has meant so much to us. And so, God, continue to be with them. Continue to be with us as we remember, Jesus, your life, your death, and your resurrection. That, Jesus, you not only live for us, but you hurt for us as well. And so thank you for that truth. Thank you that you are with us in this conflict we face in our church and in this world. But God, you have overcome the world. So our ultimate hope and trust is in you. Is there any, we pray. Amen. Conflict. Hypocrisy. Favoritism. Bad leadership, pushing away people God loves. When these words are used to describe the church, it makes us wonder what went wrong. Did you know all these problems existed in the early church as well? The difference is, when they address their issues in a healthy way, the church was able to thrive and change the world. In this series, God will equip us to do the same. Hey, hello, hello. It's great to see your smiling faces. It's great to know that I'm assuming you're smiling behind your masks. If you have your Bibles, you can open them to Acts chapter 9. We've been talking about conflict, and I talked to a few people who said, man, it feels like we just, this is a, you know, conflict is not a fun topic to talk about all the time. And so, Great news for those of you who are sick of feeling like we're talking about conflict in your life. Today we're going to talk a little bit about conflict in my life. Uh, We're going to talk about what bad leaders and bad leadership can do to a church like ours. And so if you feel like I've been pointing a finger at you, which hopefully I haven't, but if you feel like that, well then you can feel the same way I'm pointing the leader at myself, or pointing the finger at myself this week as we talk about leadership and godly leadership within Jesus' church. Because I think the hard truth that many of us have experienced firsthand is that bad leaders can easily destroy great churches. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, if you've been part of a church community where a leader had a moral failure or somebody got a platform too quickly and brought tension or destruction into the church or a leader was brought on board at a volunteer level or a staff level or a pastoral level that ended up having bad effects, collateral damage, we know that when the wrong people step into places of authority in the church, it can have really hard effects for all of us as a church community. And before COVID hit, I had an opportunity to spend some time with a pastor named Brady Boyd, who serves in Colorado Springs at a church called New Life. And if you've heard the name New Life Church, Colorado Springs, it's probably attached to a different pastor's name, Ted Haggard. Uh, Ted Haggard was a pastor of New Life until 2006, uh, when all craziness broke loose with moral failure, indiscretion, all this kind of garbage coming out of Ted Haggard's life. And and so I met with this guy, Brady, who was the new pastor of the church, who just kind of walked through what it felt like to have to weave a church back together again after a pastor had acted terribly and hurt so many people in the flock. And the sad truth is, is that we look at churches around our nation and around our world, it seems like every month, every year, every week sometimes, there's another story of a church that's hit hard by a failure of godliness in leadership from someone at the position of authority. 
whether it's the Chicago Times uh, article about Willow Creek Church in South Barrington last year, or stuff coming out of Harvest Bible Chapel, or Mars Hill up in Seattle, or stuff down in Florida, or the scandal in the Catholic Church throughout the years. All right, all of these things come to mind so often when people have authority in God's church, and they use that authority to gain money for themselves, or to do what they want, or to take the reins from God and lead in a way that serves their own ends, or they act abusive with their power, or aggressive in their leadership, or their sexual indiscretion, or all of these different things that can come into a church community and tear it apart. Now, I know on one hand, if someone's a bad leader, that's on them. If someone lacks godliness and God has placed them in a position of authority or they've taken authority, that's on them. But I think the hard truth that many of us have experienced firsthand is that our faith, your faith, is deeply linked with those who lead you. If you've been part of a church where there has been moral failure at a leadership level or indiscretion from a pastor or maybe you've been personally affected for that, you know that you or people around you have really kind of gotten a gut check in your own faith as a result of someone else's sins. their leadership failure turned into your pain and heartache. And you might have friends who no longer go to church because of something happened to them at their last church. Or you might have friends who've walked away from Jesus because a pastor or a leader or a volunteer in a high capacity let them down. And I know we don't want to believe that we're all connected, but the Bible says that all of us are connected. That as a church... We're a body, right? That's the analogy that the New Testament gives. We're the body of Christ. And so like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, that when one part of the body suffers, all the body suffers with it. That's how it works. If a pastor falls, we all get hurt by that. We're a family in the church. If you've ever experienced moral failure in your family, a father who walked out on you or a mother who had indiscretion or a divorce situation or something terrible in the leadership level of your family, it affected you as a child or you as a grandchild or a cousin or a niece or a nephew in a family when the leaders of the family fail. We all feel it. With a The most widespread illustration of what a church is, is a flock of sheep. We see that from Old Testament to New Testament. And in the the book of Isaiah, we get this image of what happens when the shepherds of the sheep lead the sheep off a cliff in a sense. God says in Isaiah 9, those who guide these people mislead them, and those who are guided are led astray. The Apostle Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. But if a leader starts following his own or her own desires instead of following Christ, and we are all following that leader, we might find ourselves in a place of heartache, of hardship, or or even shipwreck of our own faith. You know, you're probably thinking, why are you telling us about this, right? This is your job to be a good person, right? We, We are in a church that God has blessed us with the stability of leadership, By the grace of God, we haven't had moral failures that I understand. There are no skeletons in any closet around here, right? And it's amazing to see the long-term health that God has given a church like ours. I always tell people I'm the fourth senior pastor in 85 years at our church. Uh, And this is a place where God has blessed us with men and women who lead in a godly way. And at the same time, if we're going to talk about conflict in the church in this series, and we're going to walk through the book of Acts and look at the things that could potentially destroy a church in this series, we have to talk about the fact that, A, my job as a leader in this church, part of my job is to protect our church from wolves in sheep's clothing, from other men or women who might try to step into leadership and lead us in a wrong direction. Part of my job, a huge part of, probably the biggest part of my job as the senior pastor of this church is to walk in godliness in my own life. And so I just need to be on record with you guys to say, this is what I'm supposed to do, so you got to call me out if I'm walking or leading you in a way that is inappropriate or is a misuse of authority or is prideful or whatever that I could fall into. You need to know how to be equipped to sniff out and to call out and toxic, abusive, sinful, ungodly leaders because the last thing that any of us wants, especially me, including me, the last thing any of us wants is someone in this church in authority leading us in an ungodly direction or falling in a moral way that hurts them, hurts their family, and hurts us, our church family. 
And so today we're going to look at a story in Scripture that's probably familiar to you, but you probably never thought about it through this lens. This is Acts chapter 9, when the Apostle Paul is called into ministry. You know, we hear this story, we're like, this is awesome. It's this guy that God is going to put on mission to change the world. The Apostle Paul is one of the most famous missionaries, pastors, church planners in the history of the church. And yet one thing that maybe you've never noticed is when God called the Apostle Paul into ministry, the church was not very excited about it. You know, Paul had a reputation that he earned for being aggressive and hostile and murderous towards Christians. And so God calls this leader to lead in God's church, but God's people push back and say, no way. And so we're going to look at this text to learn how God wants to equip us to sniff out good leaders because Paul was someone that was commissioned into leadership and how to be gatekeepers against bad leaders and how to call out those who need to be called out all from the context of Acts chapter 9. So if you're not there yet, turn to Acts chapter 9 and we're going to read uh, a little bit of Acts chapter 9, kind of bounce through the verse um, together, that chapter together today. Uh, Two things that we need to understand as we dive into this text that really set the scene for why this is an important topic. Number one, churches are famous for being bad judges of character. Let's just own it, right? Churches are famous for being bad judges of character. A lot of times, churches will give people authority who have no place to be in authority, right? Someone wants to lead a Bible study, and the church says, yeah, you should do it, right? And they're a serial killer. Probably not, right? But not a good people personally the Bible study. The churches see the best in people. Like, we love to see God transform people. And so someone's got this history, this track record of bad behavior, and they tell us they've turned over a new leaf, and we want to hand them a microphone and a Bible and say, lead in the church, right? Churches have a, are famous for promoting uh, the wrong people sometimes and being bad judges of character. But at the same time, this is what makes it complicated. God is famous for turning once bad people into amazing leaders. And can you kind of see the tension there, right? Churches are famous for putting the wrong people in leadership. God is famous for putting the wrong people in leadership, right? And so it's going to be a struggle for us as a church trying to weed out who is someone that God has called to be in leadership who's just a little rough around the edges, right? Or just a work in progress like all of us. Or just someone with an extreme personality and we need to learn how to kind of work with them as God transforms them. And when someone wants leadership and God is trying to tell us, keep away from this person, don't trust this person, don't follow this person, hopefully you're never going to have to use anything that I'm going to tell you today, right? This is the only sermon I'll ever tell you this. Hopefully you'll never have to use anything I'm going to tell you today, but we're going to look at this text and learn how to navigate this this in life because there are going to be leaders in church. There are going to be leaders in government. There are going to be leaders in your school. There are going to be leaders in your workplace that you don't know if they're worth following or not. And we need to be equipped to know how to walk with the Lord in humility and navigate this issue. And we see the tension in verse 1 of chapter 9 when God calls Paul into ministry, and here's how it describes Saul at that time. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. That was what he was doing when God tapped him on the shoulder and said, Hey, I got a job for you come and leave my church, still breathing out murderous threats against God's disciples. It doesn't say Saul used to do this. It was in his past, right? That's what he was doing that day. He was on his way to Damascus to go and call out Christians and go tell the authorities on them and get them thrown in jail or even killed for their faith when God says, stop and come lead in my church. And the church was not ready for a man who was trying to murder them to step into the pulpit and lead them. You know, I just want to pause real quick and say, I know this seems like a really extreme example, like this never happens, but I got to tell you, I have not yet met with someone who murders Christians and wants to be in charge of church, right? But this kind of thing happens all the time because at church, we're a family. We talked about that. We know each other. Some of you have known me my whole life. I've known some of you your whole life. We've worked together in ministry for 20 years. We've gone through the hard times, the good times. We've talked through things as you've gone through your divorce or when your husband left you or when you had an affair or when you had a moral failure, right? And so we've talked through life and we've lived through the baggage of life together as a community. And so there's tension sometimes when you start sensing a calling in your life maybe that God's calling you to lead in the church and yet you and I have had conversations about some stuff in your past that we're going to have to talk about, right? Or, or maybe you come, to, I don't know, you come to one of our staff offices and say, hey, I want to talk to you because I want to lead this Bible study. And the staff member you're talking to is thinking, 
I saw you last weekend get drunk at that wedding and spout your mouth off in front of your whole family. Like, are you sure that today you're telling me that you want to lead a Bible? This stuff can potentially happen in a church like this because we're all being transformed by Jesus together, all trying to sense his calling in our life together. And so it actually happens more than you'd think that someone is starting to sense a call from the Lord towards leadership. And we as a church have to have conversations about whether or not this person is ready to step into a position of authority in God's church. You know, God calls Paul. He actually makes him blind and puts him in a house and says, wait there. And then God goes to this guy, Ananias, and we see this in, in verse 13, and tells uh, Ananias, I want you to go and commission Paul into leadership. Lay hands on him, commission him into leadership. And Ananias says, Lord, I've heard many reports about this man <laughs> And all the harm he's done to your people in Jerusalem. And he's come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. It's like Ananias is looking up towards God and saying, like, God, I hear you. You think Paul's going to be a great leader? But uh, I don't know how to tell you this. He murders people like us. Are you sure this is a good idea? Are you sure you want to call him now, right? Maybe we should have him do an internship first, right? Or maybe we should have him go to Bible school first and kind of see if we could weed him out, right? But God comes back to Ananias and says in verse 15, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And part of me wonders if Ananias is like, yes, he's going to suffer. I hate this guy, Paul, right? <laughs> doesn't say why God said that part. <laughs> but what we see is that God tells Ananias, go. I've called this man. You need to go and commission him into ministry. You know, I wrestle with this because what does this mean for us? <laughs> because there are people, like I said, who feel called to ministry that the church would push back on. There are people who sense, you know what, I, I want to lead. And the church would be like, I'm not sure, right? I don't know if this is a good idea. And we don't want to quench what the Spirit is doing, right? If the Spirit is calling you into leadership, we don't want to be a judgmental church that tells you, no, you can't lead. We don't want to be the type of community that keeps you down if God's trying to call you up. We want to keep in step with the Lord, but at the same time, we don't want to promote murderers in the leadership. We don't want to promote the wrong person. We want to put the authority in the wrong hands as a church. And so there's a tension that we sense in the text. And one thing that strikes me in the text is the way that God got Paul into leadership. God does two things. One, he calls Paul. And two, he tells someone else he's called Saul. Do you notice that? So first, God goes to Saul and says, I want you to lead in my church. And then he almost like deactivates him. Like he's a robot. He pulls the plug on. He goes, Pew, right? He's blind. He can't see anything. He's in this house. And then he goes to a church member and says, I've called this guy, Paul. You have to come and activate him. And there's this combination of Saul who's sensing a calling from the Lord with a church community that God is affirming, yes, I'm, I'm calling this person into leadership. And so the transferable principle that I see in this text first and foremost is that an individual is ready for spiritual leadership when God tells other people they're ready for spiritual leadership. Does that make sense? You know, a lot of times the, the wrong people rise into authority because they come into a church like ours and says, I want to be in charge. And we say, sure, whatever you want, right? That's not what our job is in gatekeeping this church. We don't just hand a microphone to anyone who wants one. We don't just give a Bible and a platform to anyone who wants a platform, right? That's not how church works. We know that someone's ready for spiritual leadership when God tells them and us that they're ready for leadership. You know, one thing that we've learned at our church as we've tried to navigate this is that we should be very careful with anybody who wants to be in charge where no one else thinks that they should be in charge but them, right? That seems like a pretty duh kind of thing, but... You can write that out if you want. Be very careful of anyone who wants to lead in God's church that no one thinks they should lead except for them because they'll be passionate. They'll say, God has called me. You're quenching what God's told me to do. Please, you have to give me a platform. I need to teach. I, I get people to tell me, I want to come and teach on Sunday mornings. I've got a message for your church. And I'm thinking, God didn't tell me he has a message from you for our church, right? There's a combination of God telling you and someone else and the community together decides maybe we'll let this guy in. 
know, we talk about this at a, a board level sometimes. We have a governing eldership that oversees our church. And we, we talk about the number one, uh, when you read the biblical passages of who should be an elder in the church, the first thing that Paul says is, if anyone aspires to the office of overseer, it's a good thing that he aspires to do, right? So if you want to be an elder in our church, that's awesome, right? But at the same time, we always joke as an eldership that you're not qualified to be an elder in our church unless you don't want to be an elder, right? Because we've had too many people who are like, I, I got to run this place. I want to be in charge. Hey, give me a microphone. Hey, give me whatever. Give me the checkbook. Give me, it's like, no, 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 right? So there's a tension there that the right type of people that God's calling into leadership have a combination of a, a calling to do it, but without being gripping too tightly this desire that I have to be in charge. And the way that God shows us which is which is a lot of times we have to make this decision, these decisions as a community. I remember I, I sat down a few years ago with somebody in our church who was having a hard time because she, she felt like God has, had given her a gift and given her a burning desire to do ministry. She said, I feel like I'm called to ministry. I'm trying to examine where that, that giftedness should be used. And yet she felt like every ministry she came into in our church kept shutting her down. You know, she, she tried to get a platform here. It didn't work. She tried to get a platform here. It didn't work. She tried to lead this thing. It didn't work. It just felt like she was getting doors shut in her face all over the place. And she said, Danny, can we meet? Because I'm trying to figure out how it's working. Because I feel like God's calling me to lead, but no one's given me a shot to lead. And so I said, I'd love to meet with you. And I connected with the different ministry leaders that she had brought up that felt like she had been shutting her down and just kind of started asking folks, hey, what's the reason that, that this person didn't get a platform in your ministry? And, and everyone was really nice that I talked to. They said, you know, this woman, she seems amazing. She's very talented. She's very gifted. I just don't know her well enough yet. It seems like she's here and she wants to lead, but it, it just doesn't feel right yet, right? So now I'm the person who has to go to tell, tell someone, hey, God's given you a desire to lead, but we just don't feel like you're ready yet, whatever that means. It's a hard conversation. And so I, I sat down with her. And I said, well, here's, here's what I'm sensing. I said, everyone I've talked to tells me that you've got amazing gifts, amazing natural talents, that you are amazing teaching the Bible. You're all these things. You've done such a good job. No one has any questions about your qualifications when it comes to the skills required to lead in the church. I said, but well, here's the hard thing. Leadership in God's church is not just about skills. It's also about character. It's primarily about character and about, even about reputation in the church community. And I said, I'm not, no one's trying to judge your character. We don't know if you've got an amazing character or a terrible character, right? It's, it's new. It takes time to be part of a church community and demonstrate the character required for spiritual leadership. And, and just, we just haven't had enough time yet to see that. And so no one's got questions about your character. No one's saying you have bad character, but... I think the common thread that I'm hearing is we've got someone with a lot of natural talents, and yet we haven't had enough time elapsed to judge whether or not you've got the character for ministry, and you haven't had enough time to develop a reputation as someone who loves the Lord and loves the church, and, and I think it's going to be hard for someone like you because you're ready to go, but the church is not yet ready to receive you, and so if you could spend some more time just receiving from the church and serving in the church before leading in the church, I mean, if the character's there, the, the church will see it. Right? Your reputation will grow to match the person that God has made you to be. Your transformation will become evident to all. And I'm sure that if God's called you into ministry, at some point he's going to tell the rest of us, and we're going to commission you into this thing. It's going to be amazing. But it's going to take some time. It's going to take some time. And I think that's one of the hardest. We talked about conflict last week. That's one of the hardest types of conflicts is when someone's sensing in the church God's going this direction, and the other parts of the church are sensing, I'm not sure if that's true. And yet that's something we have to weigh through because it's too risky to just give someone a shot to lead God's people if the church as a whole does not yet feel like we can affirm what this person is sensing in their lives. And God tells Saul, I want you to preach to the Gentiles. And then God tells Ananias, Saul is my chosen instrument to preach to the Gentiles. And that combination of Saul sensing the call and Ananias hearing the call and receiving the call for Saul it kind of made this catalytic moment where now Ananias went to Saul and he prayed for him and he commissioned him. He put hands on him and he said, okay, start this thing. But God is doing something here. Like the, the ice is beginning to thaw. Go and start doing the work of the ministry. You know, it's a dance, right, to determine who's fit for leadership in God's church, whether it's at a, a, like a staff level or a volunteer level. And yet it's a dance that the scriptures are very 
clear about, right? Paul tells Timothy, this is 1 Timothy 5, 22. He says, do not be hasty in the laying on of hands and do not share in the sins of others. Or don't be too quick to promote someone into leadership in the local church because if the person's got baggage or the person's got a sinful lifestyle, whatever it is, it's going to come and bite the church, right? And so don't be too quick. He tells them when he's talking about raising up elders, he says, don't bring up any elders who are recent converts, right? Because you don't know. They haven't had the time yet to demonstrate that their faith is real. And if they shipwreck in their faith, it's going to hurt a whole lot of people. God calls Paul, God tells Ananias that Paul is called, and Ananias puts him into ministry. (laughs) But then a new conflict emerges, because there's two people in the world who know that Paul is called by God into ministry, and like a billion people who don't. (laughs) And you see in verse 26 that when Paul comes into Jerusalem, he tries to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him not believing he really was a disciple. This guy gets a platform. God has given it to him. The church has commissioned him, but the body is not yet ready to receive him. And I think it's because the church is discerning. Now, that's the hard thing. There are going to be people in our church that step into leadership, and you're not going to know whether or not you're supposed to trust this person because maybe you know things about them. Or maybe you saw them when they were growing up. You're like, I don't know about this guy or this girl, right? Maybe there's something about him that rubs you the wrong way, right? I got a call after the first service today. Somebody said, Danny, I listened to your sermon. It didn't make any sense to me. Something about it rubs the wrong way, so I need to talk to you about it. I'm like, I don't know what they mean by that, right? Maybe you feel the same way. They're like, if something rubs you the wrong way, I want to talk about it, right? Maybe there are people in our church that just rub you the wrong way. And you feel like, I don't know if I want to follow this person because I don't know if I can trust that God is working in this person. That's a real tension that we face as we live life in the church, that God will bring leaders even onto this platform, and he'll tell us to set them there, and we'll put them in front of you. And you're going to think, I don't know if I want to listen to this man or this woman who's leading in this church. I think that part of the, the feeling that you have, like the pushback, like, I don't know if I want to follow this person, it's because there are people who weasel their way into churches and really destroy a lot of people. I was, I was reading this passage today, this week, that was terrifying to me. Uh, where did it go? In 1 Timothy 3, he's talking about not raising up leaders too quickly. And he says, there are, there are bad leaders in the world. These are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women. He's talking about people who are forcing their way into women's homes to take advantage of them. Who are loaded down with sins and swayed by all kinds of evil desires, right? The hard truth is that there are people in this world who want nothing more than to weasel their way into a position of authority in a church like ours and destroy people from their platform of leadership. And so it's part of the, the sensor, the radar that we have is God has given that to us because we don't want to follow people who want to lead us to hell, right? Down the wrong pathway in the wrong direction. You know, I talked to a pastor this week who is a friend of mine and a friend of mine and he said there was somebody who, when he stepped into leadership in his church who was on the staff there who was just a terrible human being and nobody knew it. T- said all the right words, talked all the right language, up on stage in front of everybody, and they found out later that this guy was using his platform as a church leader to take advantage of woman after woman after woman in the church. Drugs and sexual promiscuity and all these different things, like a married guy with kids and just weaseling his way into all the homes throughout the congregation, and it just destroyed, potentially destroyed the church community. It's hard. There are people like that in the world. And so when Paul who used to murder Christians yesterday, shows up in Jerusalem today, the church says, I don't think we're ready to follow you. And yet we know that God himself wanted Paul to lead. You know, kind of to boil it all down, if we want to maintain the health of our church, we have to do two things really really well. Number one, we must not put the wrong people into leadership And number two, we must not keep the right people from leadership, right? And this is the tension in in the Paul story, that God's trying to put the right person in power, and the church is trying to keep out the wrong person, the murderous person, from power. And so I look at this text, and I ask, how is the church supposed to know that Paul is someone truly worth following? 
And the only thing that I can see as I look at paragraph after paragraph after paragraph in Acts chapter 9 is that the reason that we can know for sure that Paul was called by God into the church is because of Jesus. And the story of Paul, is it's all about Jesus, right? If you want to write something down today, just write this down. It's all about Jesus, right? Jesus is the one who called Paul into ministry, personally. He came to Paul and said, I want you to follow me. Then Jesus himself goes to Ananias and says, this guy, Paul, I know you're scared of him, but I'm calling him into ministry. Then we see that Paul goes into Damascus and he preaches Jesus in Damascus. It says in in verse 22 that Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving Jesus is the Messiah. And so we say Jesus calls Paul, Jesus tells Ananias, then Jesus becomes the content of Paul's message. Everything in this story is all about Jesus. It's not about Paul. It's not about money. It's not about Paul's desires. It's all about Jesus. And even when, when Paul gets to Jerusalem, Barnabas, who's like the sage of the church, comes alongside Paul, and he gives him the green light thumbs up to the church, and it's all about Jesus. It says in verse 27, Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord. He saw Jesus and that the Lord Jesus had spoken to Paul and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. It's all about Jesus. You know, I know there are churches and there are people who are going to talk a big talk about everything's all about Jesus, but inside they're terrible human beings. I know it's not a perfect formula, but I think as we look at this text and we scramble on how to, how to live life in a discerning way as people who want to follow leaders in the church, I think we can do a, you, I think we can know that a church leader is fit to represent Jesus when they do a good job of representing Jesus. I, I think that's really where it boils down. Right? There are some people that you can just tell their life is all about themselves, right? Or they're in it for the money, right? And, I don't know why people get into church ministry for the money, but they're in it for the money, right? Or they're in it because they're just geeking out on authority, or they just want to be in charge. They love putting down the hammer on people. People who are not the same on the platform as they are in the real world. People whose lives are all about themselves, and they come up here and talk a good game. People who are super sweet to some people and then really cutting behind their back, right? And they are good at pretending and looking like a Christian leader, but in real life, you know them, and you know that they're terrible humans. They're double-minded, or they're double-tongued, or they're double-crossing people, right? They're just bad people. And yet then there's other people that are the real deal. They have a real story of how Jesus saved them. They've got a testimony of how God himself called them into ministry. They've got a track record of success in leading people to Christ and serving well in the community of faith. They, they've got a history of character and they've proven a reputation for themselves after a number of years. They're not a recent convert, right? They, they've shown over a decade or two decades or a lifetime of work and service that their faith is genuine and real and they're not perfect, right? Nobody's perfect, but at the same time, you can sense that God is doing something in their lives and God is actively at work in them And when they preach, they're preaching about Jesus. They're teaching the scriptures. It's not about themselves. It's about the Lord. They're humble people. And you just get a sense that they're in it for no other reason than that God has called them to be in it and that God has put them in this place. And it's about Jesus. It's not about them. I think the reason that Paul was able to get to a place that the church could trust him was because he had one message, and it was Jesus Christ himself. I mean, you can look at Paul's life. He never wavers in that. Like, sure, he's not a perfect person. Nobody is, but he just keeps walking down that road. He's trying to get the gospel out. He's trying to share Jesus with people. He's trying to plant churches. He's trying to minister to folks. He has a passion, a heart for lost people. He's, he's bleeding the gospel everywhere he goes. His life is about Jesus Christ. And if someone's life is about Jesus Christ, and God has given them a character and a reputation with that character, and God gives them a calling to lead in the church, that's the type of person that we want leading us in our church. Someone whose life is all about Jesus because this church does not belong to anyone but Jesus. I know with Paul, and I know sometimes in real life, it's difficult because God calls sinners into ministry, like me, like all of us. God calls people into places of authority that are new, that are making mistakes, that are learning on the job. Right? That's all part of the process. And so it's messy. It takes discernment. It takes humility. 
But at the end of the day, if our church is going to be a church that's healthy because we're led by godly leaders, then we need to be a church that's discerning and wise and promoting godly people into authority, not merely people who want authority into authority. You know, I think for us, as I look at this text, I I realize this is more about us than it is about you. So there's not a lot of action points for you this week. Most of it is I wanted to share with you guys a commitment that we have to you, from our church to you. As a person who's part of our church, you're watching online or in the room with us today. Here's our commitment to you. It's four things. Number one, if you come to our church, if you're part of our church, our church leadership will walk humbly with Jesus. That's what we're about. We're not interested in hiring rock stars, right? No offense if you're on our staff and you're a rock star. I don't know, right? We're not interested in hiring divas, right? We talk about this all the time. We're looking for people who walk humbly with Jesus, who are called by Jesus. That's what we're all about. And so our church leadership will walk humbly with Jesus. And there are going to be times that we don't. And then we're going to call people out. We're going to get better, right? But that's what our commitment is. We're going to walk humbly with Jesus. Number two, we'll use discernment as we raise up leaders, Right? That's the messiness of ministry, that we're all part of the body of Christ, and God is going to call many of us in this room even to step into places of leadership, volunteer leadership, staff leadership, pastoral leadership, here within the church context, and we're going to use discernment as we raise people up. We're going to keep having hard conversations about when someone's ready and when we don't sense they're ready and what a pathway might be for them to become ready if they're sensing a call to leadership and we don't sense it yet. We're going to go to people, we're going to see, say, I feel like God is calling you, and they're going to say, I don't hear it. We're like, we'll start praying about it, right? We're going to have those hard conversations and we're going to use discernment as we slowly raise up people into volunteer and staff positions of leadership here at our church. We will be discerning as we do that. Number three, we're going to hold our leaders to biblical standards. We're not going to let leaders do things that would violate what God calls leaders to be about. We're going to have people who are godly, who have character, who love Jesus, who aren't living in the lusts of the flesh, but they're living out the fruits of the Spirit. We're going to hold people to the standards that God gives for leaders in his church. Right? If you want to read through the qualifications of elders, of deacons in the New Testament, it's all about character. So we're going to hold people accountable to living out godly character if they're going to lead in our church. Right? You might be thinking about staff. We're talking about volunteers too. Right? If you're serving as a head usher, or you're serving in our children's ministry as a teacher, or you're shepherding high school kids as a volunteer, we're going to hold you to those standards. We've got covenants that we have people sign, even at a volunteer level, to say, I believe the doctrine of three crosses. I'm going to live a lifestyle that's marked out in these deacon passages in 1 Timothy and Titus. I, you hold me accountable to living out a Christian lifestyle, and we will hold our leaders to biblical standards. Because what we don't want to do, but what we will do, is we will... Hold bad leaders accountable for their actions. It's never fun to boot somebody because they they lack character and they've demonstrated that. It's never fun to walk with someone through a process of removal or even restoration when they've sinned or fallen morally. It's no fun to have conversations with someone and say, you know what, I, I feel like you are not a good fit to lead at this time because of this or that or this or that. That's not the fun part of church, but that's an important part of church. And so we will hold bad leaders accountable for their actions, for their behavior, for their character, because we want our leaders to look like the top three things of this list, and we don't want to be led astray by people who, who want to lead us down bad paths. You know, all we ask of you all, if, as you're part of this church, is three things. I had to do four, you get to do three. Three things. Number one, pray for the leadership of our church. You know, I had a conversation with someone this week who was meeting with a Christian counselor, and he said, you know, my counselor told me that every time he's ever counseled a pastor who's had a moral failure, the pastor has said, six months ago, I would have never thought I would be sitting in your office today. Like, no pastor ever thinks they're going to fail morally. No church leader ever thinks they're going to walk off a cliff in their faith. No one ever wants to do that. And so pray for the leadership of our church, that God would protect our leadership, that God would give godliness and character to our leadership, that God would give quick repentance for the sins within our leadership, because we're all humans. We're all one family here. And our leaders at our church are not superhuman. They're human just like the rest of us. And so pray for the leaders of our church. Number two, trust the leadership of our church. You know, if we do our job to be discerning, to be wise, to, to listen to the Lord, to keep in step with the Spirit when we promote people into volunteer and staff positions here, and you're praying and we're working, hopefully we can build a culture like we talked about last week where we can trust the leadership of our church. 
If somebody rises into a position, you're like, I don't know about this person, right? Give them the benefit of the doubt, right? Because there's a process, hopefully, that we're walking through to discern that God is trying to give this person a chance. We want to be a church that gives people a chance at the right time. But finally, this is where the rubber meets the road a lot of times. Come forward if you see ungodly behavior in our leaders. And that's what I would love for you to do as a church. Uh, I'm not saying, like, if you see... I don't know, like your small group leader at Safeway bought a bottle of wine and now you're mad. You're, like, that's not what we're talking about, right? Ungodly behavior. If you see aggression, abuse, uh, patterns of sin, pridefulness, like these things that indicate there's something off in their spiritual life, right? If they're, they're greedy for money, all the stuff the scripture says you don't want in leaders, if you see that in someone, you got to tell someone, right? It's like on the BART train. If you see something, say something, Right? We're not trying to create a culture where people are like calling out people all the time, right? I mean, judgmental culture. But at the same time, I got to tell you, if there's someone in leadership at our church who's not a godly person, and you're wondering, why did Three Crosses allow that person to be in leadership? It's because we have no idea that they're an ungodly person, and they've eluded this whole thing, or they've been sneaky about it. So come forward if you know, if you know something we don't know, because the last thing we want is ungodly people leading folks in our church astray. You know, we're all a family. Our volunteer leaders, our staff leaders, our pastoral leaders, like no one is more important than anybody else here. We're all being transformed by Jesus along the way. We need to hold each other accountable to these things. Now, I love that there's a combination in the pastoral epistles in the New Testament that says, don't entertain an accusation, accusation against an elder in the church unless it's brought forth by multiple witnesses, right? If there's a pattern of sin, call it out. But just if one person makes a comment, don't go on a witch hunt, right? But at the same time, if someone falls in leadership, rebuke them publicly because it's a big deal. We need to keep our leaders accountable to biblical standards. And so as you navigate life in our church, my prayer and our prayer together today can be that God would allow us to continue to have the grace of being led by people who are in submission to his spirit, keeping in step with Jesus and representing Jesus well. Because at the end of the day, our church is all about him. Now, I, our board calls me the senior pastor of this church. I told them last month, you know, the, the only person in the New Testament called pastor is Jesus, right? The, the title senior pastor is from 1 Peter 5 that says, when the chief shepherd, senior pastor, when the chief shepherd appears, you elders will receive the crown of glory. That's Jesus, right? So let's be careful. I'm not in charge of this church, right? Don't put your faith in me, right? Our church, our pastors, our leaders, our volunteers are not in charge of this church. This is Jesus's church. And so we submit to him together as a community and as under shepherds of his, as leaders who are stewarding the authority he gives to each of us in the places that we serve, we're called to represent him well. And so pray that we would do that. And we're gonna, I'm gonna invite the band back up. We're gonna sing a couple more songs. But one of the things we're gonna do today is receive communion together. And what I love about communion in a context like this is that it's a reminder that, that he is in charge and we're his people together. And we're all eating from one bread. We're all eating, not literally, I know it's COVID season. We're all philosophically eating from one loaf of bread. We're all drinking from one cup, theoretically, right, in the gospel. We are one in Christ Jesus. And so as you hold these elements, if you've got the little bread in the cup, you can start to open them now. Um, as you're holding these elements in your hands, think about the fact that Jesus is in charge of our church and his church. And we are members of his body, serving side by side, sharpening one another, and walking humbly with him as we live in the world. So let's sing, hold these elements, prepare them, and I'll come up and I'll lead, them, lead us in just a couple minutes.